In 1989, uh, shortly before the fall of the Berlin Wall, a political thinker called Francis Fukuyama wrote a remarkable essay called The End of History. Uh, for Fukuyama, history was written in the grand strokes of ideological contest. Since the French Revolution, the forces of freedom and the forces of control had been at wars with each other. But it wasn't until American free market capitalism had slowly made its way across Europe and beyond that democracy had begun to take seed in Latin America and parts of Asia, that Francis Fukuyama finally felt that the great battles of history had been fought and won. Now, I want to bring you back to 1989 uh, and Fukuyama's reflection on that time in the world, not because I think it is close to where we are today, but because I think it is utterly foreign to it. Uh, in 1989, I was six years old. Uh, through the 1990s, in my teenage years, I saw the advent of the uh, personal computer, the internet, uh, cheap flight travel. People moved around the world like never before. In the year that I finished high school, two planes flew into the Twin Towers in New York. Uh, and I remember very distinctly going to history class that morning, actually, studying the causes of the First World War and feeling that something had changed in the air that morning that I was going to talk to my kids about uh, one time into the future. Um, for me, and I say this as someone who has lived in that period, what has defined the last three decades for me has not been the end of history, uh, but has been the end of certainty. Uh, the sense in which we are able to predict the future is less than ever before. But the idea that we live at the end of certainty does not mean that we live in a world without progress. It simply means that the key to success, the way in which we win in that world, is different. It's not about being linear, it's about being adaptive. It's not always about being right, it's about knowing when you're wrong and having the capacity to change. And for me, that's how I understand the idea of wickedness. I know today's session is called Wicked Problems, Great Opportunities, but for me, one does not follow the other. Great opportunities only come out of wicked problems if we have the capacity to identify failures and we know how to adapt in the face of those failures. Now, for me, that's not actually a new idea. It's an old idea. It's essentially evolutionary biology applied to the world of ideas. The idea that through variation and selection, trial and error as the process by which we get to best answers more often. The problem is that that idea is actually highly counterintuitive, highly uncomfortable. The idea that error is the secret to our success, that is, by identifying the mistakes that we make as our surest path for progress, is something that most of us, including myself, find deeply uncomfortable. Far more common is the idea that we progress in a linear fashion, that we pursue what I describe as the magnifying glass trap, the pursuit of things that we know and we know well and we continue in the same direction. Now, I want to give you a concrete illustration of what I mean, just to demonstrate that idea. Um, and it's already come up, which is great. Um, it's a picture of a box of pins, a candle and some matches. And the question is, how do you pin the candle to the wall and light it so that wax doesn't fall on the table? Now, the most common answer to this problem uh, is to take the candle, take a pin, try and pin the candle at some strange angle and hope that when the candle is lit, that the wax falls down the candle rather than onto the table. The correct answer is to empty the box of pins, pin the box to the wall, and put the candle inside the box. That is, use the box as a candle holder. Now, I really struggled when I first saw this puzzle. It turns out those who are best at getting it right are five-year-olds. This is known as the Dunker candle problem. It was developed by a cognitive psychologist called Carl Dunker in the 30s and 40s. And he used it to describe what he called functional fixedness, our tendency to fixate on a particular way of seeing the world by its first impressions, by the way in which a problem is initially framed to us and struggling to see the softer way of looking at a puzzle. Um, now, there are two sorts of conclusions that you can draw from this particular puzzle. One is to say that humanity is in a very dire place in, the, in a world of wicked problems. If we can't even solve very simple or seemingly simple problems like the Dunker candle problem, how do we have any chance of solving more complex problems like climate change, the war on terror and beyond? What we need are smarter, more intelligent, better educated people to uh, provide guidance 
uh, in a storm uh, so that we can sort of solve these uh, otherwise very difficult problems. That's one view. A better view, I think, though, is to say that this actually isn't an intelligence test. It has, says nothing about education or rationality. Um, it's about the way in which information is presented to us. When information is presented in a particular way, we struggle to solve a problem. But when, is it, when it is presented differently, so when the box, the pins, the candle and the matches are all presented as separate items, most people solve this problem pretty straightforwardly. So I, I give you that puzzle as a sort of an illustration of what I want to talk about. But I want to turn now to a real life problem, a problem which is deeply complex, deeply wicked, which I think we have struggled with for a very long time because I think that we have been caught in the magnifying glass trap because we have framed it in the wrong way. And that has affected our ability to solve the problem. Uh, and that problem is climate change. And for me, uh, my thinking on this really came together in mid-2010 in a conversation I had uh, with a man called Kumi Naidu. Uh, some of you may have heard of him. He is the executive director of Greenpeace International. And just to give you a bit of background, a remarkable guy, uh, grew up on the rough side of Durban in South Africa in the 60s and 70s, put himself through school, uh, won a Rhodes Scholarship to study politics in Oxford and did his PhD there. Eventually came back to South Africa to help fight apartheid alongside Nelson Mandela and eventually decided that it was climate change where he was going to make uh, the contribution for the rest of his life and he became the head of Greenpeace International. And in mid-2010, I was there talking to him about the politics of climate change, why he thought people struggled with this issue. And as I listened to Kumi, uh, I realised that I could not have disagreed with him more. For Kumi, persuading people of his point of view on climate change was about dramatic images, uh, dramatic weather events that were happening around the world, showing them to people and letting people see uh, the evidence. Uh, the sinking islands in the Pacific, the droughts of Africa where people were dying. It was by showing those dramatic images that you were able to persuade people that climate change was real. The problem for me was that if you held a different view to Kumi or on climate change, you would use images and dramatic weather events to make the complete opposite point. When Barack Obama flew out of Copenhagen uh, in December 2009, he flew into a snowstorm on the east coast of the United States, both literally and figuratively. He was trying to make the case for a federal agency on global warming at the time. But making the case for global warming at a time of incredible cold didn't make sense to a bunch of people. Presenting climate change through the frame of weather events was instantaneously gratifying uh, and made sense in particular contexts. But the extent to which you were able to bring people on the journey was as volatile as the weather itself. Uh, it was the wrong question. The correct question, from my perspective, was one of authority. How, in a representative democracy, do we delegate to experts on those areas where we don't have the expertise, but retain within our parliaments uh, the ability to decide on issues uh, which are, are, are genuinely for the people? That is a very difficult question, but it is the right question. And identifying great opportunities in a wicked world is not about easy questions, it's about calling time on the wrong questions. Uh, it's about realising that sometimes we're activating the wrong part of the brain in the way in which we communicate on a problem, and we have to acknowledge that failure and we have to change. Now that's a reflection on a macroeconomic issue, climate change. Uh, I want to turn to a more practical issue, um, and I want to tell the story uh, of a man who spent his entire career uh, fighting against the magnifying glass trap, the tendency of well-paid, well-trained professionals to be fixated on a particular way of solving a problem uh, and being relatively intolerant to an alternative way of thinking about it. And that man is a man called Archie Cochran. Uh, Archie Cochran is a man who never won a knighthood, uh, but uh, he has a national library in the UK named after him. He's a man who spent his life uh, carrying out randomised clinical trials in medicine. Uh, and there are many uh, stories told about Archie, and I want to repeat one of them this evening, or today actually, uh, just looks like evening, um, which uh, is about a clinical trial he did um, on heart disease. So many of his colleagues uh, in the coronary units of hospitals were utterly convinced that the best way in which people could recover after a heart attack was inside the specialised coronary units of hospitals that sending them home would kill them. 
Now, Archie wasn't so convinced about that. He wasn't sure that that was, in fact, the correct conclusion, even though they were absolutely convinced about it. And so he wanted to do a randomised trial. He wanted to test that notion. And he struggled at first against uh, the medical profession and getting that trial up. But eventually, a city was willing to take him on and he had a couple of hospitals and he sent 50 of the patients or half the patients uh, back home after their heart attacks and 50 into the hospitals. And a couple of months into the experiment, he called together his colleagues, they were all men at the time, and he, he said, um, gentlemen, I have some data which I want to share with you. Uh, it's not statistically significant yet, but I think the findings are worth discussing nonetheless. It turns out um, that I was wrong and you were right. By sending uh, patients home after their heart attacks, uh, you kill them more often. And that, the room absolutely exploded. Arch, we always knew that you were killing people. This is an absolute national disgrace. We have to shut down this trial right away. And he waited for all the anger in the room to abate. And he said, well, look, gentlemen, that's very interesting because when I presented the information to you, I switched the two columns. It turns out that it's not sending people home that's killing people. It's sending people to your specialised coronary units that's killing people. So what I suggest we do is we continue to run this trial and we work out what is the correct uh, path forward and we pursue that. And of course, there was absolute silence in the room after that. But Archie was disposed towards doing those sort of things because for him, it was all about challenging within each of us uh, what he called the God complex. Um, Archie didn't, wasn't convinced that he had the answers to all our trickiest problems, but he did think he had a thought on something far more powerful, which is the process, the process by which we get to better answers more often. For Archie, the world was too complex for any one person to credibly say that they had the answers to the world's trickiest problems. Now, I started with a political thinker, Francis Fukuyama. I want to finish with another political thinker, uh, which is Isaiah Berlin. In 1953, Isaiah Berlin wrote an essay called The Hedgehog and the Fox. Uh, and in that essay, he opens with a fragment from Greek poetry, uh, which says, um, the hedgehog knows one thing, but the fox knows many. Now, in that essay, he went on to talk about Tolstoy's view of history. But in that opening few pages, he, he uses the hedgehog and the fox to describe two types of people in the world. The hedgehog, someone who is utterly convinced on how the world works and injects all the significance of the world into those singular idea. And the fox, life's natural sceptics, constantly doubting themselves and always trying to look for a better way of doing things. Now, he didn't make a judgment as to which was better or worse. But many decades later, Philip Tetlock, who was a professor at the University of Pennsylvania, did a study of businessmen, journalists, politicians, policymakers, uh, who were both hedgehogs and foxes, and worked out which were better at, at predicting the future. What Tetlock found was that hedgehogs were often certain they were right about the future, but turned out to be wrong. Foxes, by contrast, always doubted whether or not they had the right answers, but turned out to be right more often. Now, one of the most complex and wicked problems that I think has been reframed and changed over the last decade um, has been the war on terror. Uh, shortly after September 11, President Bush kept the picture of 22 terrorists in his Oval Office desk. And every time one of these guys was knocked off, he would put a cross through their face. Now, there was an implication in the way in which uh, he was doing that activity. Uh, he was focused on the war on terror as a pursuit of terrorists, the armed combatants. Now, that's one way of thinking about that problem. Another is not to focus on the terrorists, but to focus on terrorism. That is, not the armed combatants, but the social network of armed combatants who are co-opted into the war on terror. And if you thought about that alternative way of looking at the war on terror, it changed the way in which you sought to solve the problem. Now, that second way of thinking about it turned into what was known as counterinsurgency theory, uh, which changed the way in which uh, uh, the US military attacked the war on terror and helped uh, support the de-escalation of violence within Iraq. Um, but many years after the war in Iraq, I asked uh, the retired Lieutenant Colonel John Nagel, how do you know that by reframing the war on terror from focusing on the terrorists to terrorism, that he was right, that he was actually going to solve the problem, that he was going to make the world a better place? And his answer surprised me. He said, Eric, uh, we didn't know. We could have been wrong. But if we were wrong, 
we would have changed tack. Victory doesn't fall on the side of those who are utterly convinced they were right. The side, that, the side that learns fastest, he said, is the side that wins. Thank you very much. Thank you.